Hello, good morning, and uh, welcome to this week. Good morning, Revolution, Scott. Good morning, Joe, and good morning, Revolution. And good morning to you, uh, comrades out there watching and listening. So it's been a big week, uh, in many ways, a uh, scary week. Uh, a lot is happening around the country with respect to the coronavirus crisis. We hope everybody is staying safe and uh, social uh, distancing. Um, are you guys doing that up uh, upstate where you are, Scott? Are you staying yeah. home? Not yeah, um, I mean, mostly. I I'm, I'm staying home except for uh, essential errands. Um, and uh, I, I did, uh, uh, my wife and I did go out to get ice cream uh, last night. Thursday night is generally our date night. Ice cream night, okay. Uh, and uh, so, um, we were listening to people in the in line at the the window of the ice cream place, you know, mm -hmm. keeping a, a a safe distance from one another. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there was a, a family talking about how they were going to go home and and play Cards Against Humanity over Zoom with friends. Okay. Uh, so they they were still finding a way to you know interact without without spreading, which I thought was pretty cool. Well, I've been I've been home for several days now. I had to go to the doctor last Friday, uh, but other than that, I was nervous about doing that. You know, it's like stay away from me. It, you know, I had a cross of garlic. Yeah. So, what were the security uh, procedures like to get into the the doctor's office or the clinic? Well, you just walked in. You just okay. Next, they, if if you had been if you had a fever or if you contacted or if you were in contact with anybody who either was diagnosed with the virus or had a fever. Other than that, they were, they were. I, I know that um, my wife is a, is a physician and her workplace, um, it's a big hospital and clinic complex and they've closed down all but two entrances and they're using infrared thermometers to take everybody's temperature uh, as you go in the door. Is that right? Well, you gotta be careful, you gotta be careful. But this social distancing, I don't know why they use that phrase by the way, you know, they need to speak, you know, they got one is social distancing and the other one that they use is uh, uh, shelter in place. Mm -hmm. Talk English to people, mm -hmm. say things in ways that are clear so that people can understand what you Don't talking. go out of your house. <laughs> yeah, stay but at home, stay <laughs> at home, you know. Find a comfortable chair. You know, don't uh, go to the barbershop, y'all. You know, yeah. I, I, need, I need it. I, I really need to get to the barbershop. I but don't need it. Hold on. I shaved uh, this morning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't have to worry. But it's really important to uh, do this um, because we learned the other night, we were talking with an expert that, you know, you got to uh, flatten the curve. Um, flatten the curve. That is to reduce as much as possible in order to slow down the increase of people who are getting infected by stop the human interaction as much as possible. Yep. You know? and, and part of the part of the need is to um, even even if the I mean the, the rate of, of infections and the need for hospitalization is certainly going to to increase, but um, there's a big difference in our ability to respond between um, the infections, the infection spreading slowly and, and having hospitals, you know, have time to treat people and discharge people and or having everybody all at once slamming. They lose of uh, yeah. um, overwhelming the system and that kind of thing. We certainly uh, want to uh, avoid uh, that. Uh, it's good to hear that in other places around the world that they've been able to slow and even stop. Mm -hmm. In China, for example, they've only had, uh, they haven't had a new infection in a couple of days. And so uh, they took some extraordinary measures to uh, uh, do that. Um, we, we heard that when there were just 400 infections there, they decided to close off the province in which the large city, what was the name of the city? Uh, the, yeah, the city of Wuhan uh, had 11 million people and the, the Hubei province uh, is a, a province of 60 million people. And right. they, they closed it off entirely. 
and they were able to stop the spread to other parts of the country. And, and one of the things this expert also brought out was that um, that response, as, as extraordinary, as, as, as extreme as it seemed to, to a lot of people at the time, gave the rest of the world the opportunity to put measures in place, an opportunity that was not always um, taken advantage of. And, uh, you know, breathing space, breathing space. <laughs> Of themselves as as uh, as uh, doing that uh, as an act of sacrifice to to other peoples and countries uh, around the world, uh, but unfortunately, um, well, they did it in Singapore and in South Korea and in Taiwan, it seems. Um, but here in the West, we we haven't taken uh, advantage of it. You know, I saw an opinion piece in, I think it was, I don't remember if it was the New York Post or the or New York Times or Washington Post um, saying, was uh, comparing the, you know, Italy has now surpassed China in terms of the uh, coronavirus uh, fatalities. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it was saying, is, you know, is this high death rate uh, the risk of an open society sort of you know, falling back on that that very stereotypical um, mm. idea of like the what the democratic, open capitalist West versus the you know repressive, authoritarian, communist China. Um, mm. it, it's it's the wrong way of of posing the question. It's the the higher death rate is the risk of having a society and an economy um, where planning has been rejected and where collective solidarity has been rejected. And it's the risk of capitalism, I think. Um, yes, and uh, you know, the point is to be able to have the confidence of the people and an efficient uh, medical system and an efficient government so that you can mobilize, you know, large groups, large populations to take measures quickly. And uh, I think I think I think that's the uh, a lesson. Well, we wish everybody the uh, best. Uh, we want everybody to stay safe. Uh, we're going to be issuing a, a statement and platform to address it because not only has it affected uh, the uh, our health, but it's also affected the health of the economy. Not that the economy was all that healthy from Jump Street, you know. Um, it wasn't, but the stock market is, has been catering and careening and going up and down and sideways. Uh, and the unemployment now is uh, skyrocketing. Um, and did you hear Trump ask states not to release their unemployment? Uh, typical, yeah. typical. Just, just hide it and, and hope that, because uh, it, it's, it's all part of, you know, his, uh, he was already facing a battle for, for re-election and um, part of his, his pitch is, oh, I'm the greatest jobs president, whatever. So this is, this does not look good for him. calling it a hoax. It's, it's worth noting. Um, so there have now been two different uh, relief plans released, one by the Democratic-led House and another by the Republican-led Senate. Mm -hmm. um, the plan... Uh, released by the House is $750 billion um, and prioritizes paid sick leave, paid family leave, expansion of unemployment, um, and, and really uh, stuff focused on workers. There is also um, uh, loans and guarantees, I believe, for, for corporations, but um, there is a, a focus on helping workers. The Senate plan is $1 trillion and um, downplays all of the the worker oriented stuff and is much more focused on emergency loans, cash infusions to uh, corporations. Um, so you can see, I mean, I think there are two points that have to be made about it. One is um, you can't claim that um, a Democratic majority in Congress and a Republican majority in Congress are the same thing. They're cl this clearly shows the difference, but at the same time, the House of Representatives would not be putting forth a a plan as progressive as um, what it's doing had it not been for the forces within the Democratic Party um, 
challenging the kind of establishment, challenging the ruling class and demanding, you know, a, a people's solution. Um, so there's- That's what we have to continue to fight for and advance a working class and people's solution that emphasizes, you know, assistance, jobs, um, support, you know, healthcare, people, you know, I wonder what's gonna happen to uh, A, people who are uninsured, you know, mm -hmm. uh, immigrants who don't have uh, paper, paper, you know, um, homeless, uh, people who are underinsured, you know, uh, and uh, who are afraid to go to the doctor because they don't want their, you know, um, payments to uh, go up. And, um, and we're talking about millions of people, you know, or people who are working and they're afraid to take time off because they lose their jobs, which, you know, are already uh, precarious. You know, all of Sorry, my, my phone is doing something crazy. Uh, I'm going to try and silence it here. Silence that phone. It's, it's, uh, it's, there we go. It's, okay. I don't know. I'm going crazy. Phone is uh, very party to this conversation. Uh, that's all right. Next time, answer it and see if the person wants to join us. Wants uh, to join us in the uh, conversation. But the point is that we need a working class and people's response, uh, emphasizing the bottom up, but not the top, not the top uh, down. I yeah, guess. I wonder what's going to happen to you know. If you think about healthcare workers, um, obviously there are the the doctors and nurses, the people in direct patient care, but there are also a ton of people who sit at desks and are, you know, um, re receptionists or patient, patient service specialists or whatever, who are interacting with huge numbers of, uh, of people all the time, um, mm -hmm. what, what protections are being put in place, you know, to make sure they stay healthy. And um, so this is, it's a, it's a big, it's a big thing. And it really, it really demonstrates the, the inability of capitalism, the inability of this this drive to maximize profits um, to address any kind of crisis like this. We're in uncharted territory, you know, it's new, it's new terrain. We've never been quite uh, in a situation like this, but maybe close to it was the 1918 uh, pandemic. Uh, but, you know, for our generation, certainly um, it's, a, it's a totally no. And so uh, the most important thing now is to stay healthy, uh, and stay safe, or stay calm, and uh, begin to think through, you know, how we're going to get through this. And we will get through it. Mm -hmm. We're going to get through it. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take, um, a month, uh, uh, eight weeks. I don't know, but we will certainly uh, get there. And while we uh, do that, we will continue to post articles to our website. We'll continue with this program and we will continue to carry on a discussion about the most important ideas of our, our time. Um, I wonder how this is going to impact the uh, Democratic campaign for the presidency. If Mr. Biden is ahead. The next uh, primary won't be uh, for three weeks. Uh, uh, Mr. Sanders uh, is still campaigning, though. I do understand, I read in the newspaper that he's gonna get together with his uh, uh, folks in Vermont, uh, his campaign and talk about what the next steps are. Uh, it's, yeah. really, it's really important to recognize in this that um, I guess two things. One is, as we mentioned before, this, this crisis shows the need for working class leadership for a, you know, uh, a plan based on the needs of the people and not on the needs of corporations and the need for a program like the one that Bernie and the movement around him have been have been pushing for. At the same time, um, working class leadership, the possibility of it, the need for it doesn't evaporate um, if Bernie leaves the race, if he doesn't win the primary. Um, it, the, the struggle changes a little bit, but the, the possibility is still there and the need is still there to make the working class the leader of the movement to unseat Trump and to put our mark on this, um, the process of responding to the coronavirus. 
Yeah, I think I think I think that that's very very true. Um, we have to continue to keep the pressure on, you know, in in, in every way that we can. Uh, so we'll we'll see what happens. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. In order to defeat Trump, it's going to take a movement. It's going to take a movement of the broad left and the broad center. You know. Uh, the team is going to have to be, you know, black, white, brown, Asian, you know, or some combination of that, male, female, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Biden pledged to have a woman, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good uh, first step. Um, if, in fact, he turns out to be the nominee. Um, and so we'll have to, you know, wait and see who that person uh, is. Will it be someone who is capable of generating the excitement. Uh, you know what I, I, I'd love to see in a certain sense is, is Stacey Abrams, um, though I'm sure she has uh, incredibly important work that she's, that she's doing in. Um, she's in working her, around the uh, voter uh, oppression. Uh, yeah. Extremely, extremely important. Um, so we'll see. Elizabeth Warren also had a lot of momentum around yeah. her campaign, you know. Um, and I think people are going to turn out. One thing that the Democratic primary showed is that the turnout was up, even in the primaries. People mm -hmm. were motivated and, and organized to to come out. The turnout was up, except for youth, which is a which is yeah, a danger. Into that, I wonder how much it was down in comparison to turnout in other primary contests. We got to take. I read after the after Super Tuesday, um, I saw one article that said uh, overall it was down even compared to 2016 primaries. Is that right? I wonder yeah. by how much and where it would be important to to uh, take a very specific uh, look yeah. at it and then uh, uh, try to understand why mm -hmm. due to lack of interest or was it due to voter suppression? What mm -hmm. what? What exactly happened? Yep. We need to we, we need to know that because I think that young people obviously have a big stake in the election and and the big thing will be to mobilize the turnout in the general election. Obama was able to do that twice, and uh, it's going to be really important if we want to defeat Trump to uh, do it again. Can't count. Be a big mistake to count the young generation uh, out. Yeah. Well, we got to end in a moment, but we had a question. People write into our mailbag and they, they want to know answers to, they have inquiring minds and they want to know what was the question that they asked us. Uh, so we had a couple questions about the idea of market socialism and uh, whether we, um, so a couple people wrote in saying, you know, we're afraid of authoritarianism. We're afraid of, of, of the, the idea of state, you know, control of the economy. Um, What's your opinion on uh, an economy based on worker co-ops and, and market socialism? Um, what are your thoughts, Joe? Cooperative. So Richard Wolf. Yeah. Who is my, uh, come from my hometown, by the way. He's a, he's a Youngstown. So One person calls it the Catalonian model of socialism. I'm sorry? One person called it the Catalonian model of socialism. Yeah, they had this. Cooperatives there. Parts with an M. The Mondragon. Huh? The Mondragon Cooperative. Mondragon. Uh, well, you know, I think it's one form, you know. Um, my thinking is that we would be in favor of multiple forms of collective property, you know. Um, collective property, state uh, co uh, cooperatives uh, being uh, 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 three of them. Um, some people uh, are arguing for a socialist market economy or what they call market socialism. Uh, to me, that's just another way to uh, repackage state capitalism, you know? Um, um, I think that, uh, which in certain circumstances are, are necessary when you're rebuilding your economy, you're trying to move from an un underdeveloped or undeveloped situation like they were in China or in Vietnam or in Cuba. Uh, but in situations of advanced capitalism, where you have a big working class, a highly 
uh, developed uh, technological and scientific plant. Um, uh, I'm not sure that those kinds of things are, are necessary, those kinds of uh, market mechanisms yeah. that would be the dominant form of the e economy. Though I, I do think that particularly in the initial stages will require small and medium sized businesses, certainly. I think uh, socialism is, um, it's not a specific arrangement of uh, the state or of government or, or whatever. That's not what defines it. Socialism means that the working class holds economic and political power and exercises it democratically through uh, collective institutions of, of various sorts. Right. Um, Don't mean big government. Yeah. Doesn't mean the government owns everything. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess my question would be if we look at healthcare, energy, defense, um, can we can we engage in the kind of collective democratic planning for a sustainable society when industries and firms of the size that they are um, are, are, are managed you know by a cooperative of their workers I don't think so there, there, are, there are certain parts of the economy that will require um, nationalization with democratic mechanisms to ensure you know, uh, the people's role. Um, but there are also, there's also, as you said, a place for uh, workers co-ops, a place even for, for private ownership of, of small businesses. Um, but the, the, the question is um, the democratic control of all resources by the working class in its own interest. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I think that one of the things that you gotta look at is the level of technology that exists now um, and the ability um, to utilize it to plan at the national, state, and local level. Um, and, um, and some economies are, you know, uh, very localized, you know, and so um, it's, not, it's not clear to me that with the instantaneous exchange of information, the sharing of, of, uh, of uh, medical records, uh, the able to quantify certain uh, trends in healthcare and so on and so forth, that uh, those things don't put a local hospital or group of hospitals in a place to, in a cooperative sense, uh, deliver uh, uh, care to the um, patients. You know, it, yes. it, 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 I think that uh, we're in a, we're in a, uh, a new, uh, technological situation with respect to planning, and uh, it's not clear to me that all of that has to happen at a uh, a, a national level. I don't know. Right. So maybe the maybe the maybe where the the difference is less between nationalized and um, cooperatively owned or uh, centrally planned and market, but um, the basis of planning. Uh, so. The, the real problem is when you when you try to plan an economy based on competition of firms to maximize profit. Mm. Uh, that is what has that is not compatible with socialism. Right. Certainly not in big firms. So workers cooperatives um, uh, operating on a coordinated uh, not for profit basis potentially. Um, worker owned cooperatives competing for profit uh, is a much different thing. Well, let me ask you one question, and then we'll have to end this uh, program. And that is, is the problem the maximization of the profit, or is the problem the use of, uh, to which that uh, profit is put? Um, well, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the question, in a certain sense, between socialists and, and social democrats, right? The, the social democratic approach is to focus on redistribution, to say, you know, let firms uh, make a profit, and then the the state will take uh, a section of that and redistribute it to uh, achieve various social ends. Whereas, in my understanding, I mean, the, the Marxist approach is to say that um, you intervene in in production. You change how production is set up so that the profits don't go to uh, private owners in the first place. They they go to uh, society as a whole, you don't have to 
But let's assume that that you have a society that's run with multiple forms of property, cooperative property, and in each of them, the in each of those uh, enterprises or different forms, uh, profits will be made. Mm -hmm. And so, is the issue whether or not they're maximized or whether or not they're distributed? Uh, in a way which benefits society. Part so of the issue. Something, well, something to uh, think about. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sending the question. Who sent that question in, by the uh, way? They, they didn't put their names, sir. Uh, okay, well, you all, you keep sending us in questions and we'll attempt to answer them in the best way possible. But until next week, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, you know, uh, write to us if you're bored. Mm -hmm. If you want to write an article, please send it in. If you want to do a video, and, uh, send, us, send us in an uh, audio clip about, you know, what you're thinking about, what you're doing, what your experiences have been. Yeah. Tell us about how you're, how you're coping with this crisis. Um, yes, yeah, you can send it to cpusa at cpusa.org. Check out our website at cpusa.org. We've got a lot of new articles uh, up. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week. See you next week. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.